Testing fuel and emissions test five. And we're basically talking about some of this uh, onboard diagnostics and vehicle network stuff. This is a sort of, you know, bounce to hit the highlights of some questions about it. Freeze frame generated on an OBD2 vehicle uh, is what, what? When is a freeze frame generated? Freeze frame is when you go to your freeze frame on your scan tool, you're going to see a snapshot of a bunch of parameters. B, when, a type a. when a type A or B diagnostic mis uh, trouble code is set, that is B. B is the correct answer for that one. If you put anything down there besides A, then you need to slap yourself. Uh, ignition misfire or fuel. Huh? Besides A. Excuse me, besides B. Did I say that? I, say that? <laughs> I sure got y'all messed up. Y'all were going to slap yourself, weren't you? No, All right. Yeah. An ignition misfire or fuel mixture problem is an example of what kind of diagnostic trouble code? That's a type A misfire. If it's got a steady misfire, that's a type A misfire, and it's going to flash the check engine light. Now, there's other, you know, any kind of a, of a code that's going to, that can damage the catalyst is a problem. You got me? Uh, the com comprehensive component monitor checks computer control devices for what? Rationality, functionality, opens, all of the above. Uh, all right, now, somebody tell me again what rationality means. What's a rationality check? The computer just simply says, "Would this already happen?" Yeah, that. that's a that's a good answer. Uh, more specifically, if the idle air control is commanded to open up, then the mass airflow should reflect that there's more air coming in. That's basically what it does, you know. And you may even see a code in some cases that will say, uh, "Airflow did not increase when idle air control was," or something like that, you know. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a rationality check in transmissions they do that, you know, like I was telling you the other day. If the drive shaft is spinning at the wrong speed for the engine speed and the gear that it's in, it'll tell you that's a rationality check of sorts. So functionality means is it working at all? Functionality means, uh, you know, rationality means I gave it, I told the idle air control to open up. I saw the engine speed increase, but I did not see the mass airflow report that. See, that's rationality check. Functionality means I told it to increase the idle speed and it didn't happen. Didn't yeah, and an open means I'm supposed to see somewhere between one volt and 4.6 coming out of that sensor, and I see zero, or I see five volts. See what I'm saying? Uh, which basically that would be opens or shorts if, if you want to go that route. Uh, OBD2 has been on all passenger vehicles in the United States since 1996. 1996 is basically the one that you're going to be looking at there. Uh, uh, but like I say, I've seen, I saw some uh, one-ton pickups that didn't have it until 98. Uh, which of these is a continuous monitor? A continuous monitor. Oxygen sensor monitor, catalyst monitor, fuel system monitor, or EGR monitor? Which one of those is operating all the time when the engine running? The fuel system monitor. No, the oxygen sensor doesn't. The oxygen sensor is gonna not even be online for a little. I mean, for a few. Well, probably 90 seconds. That's true. That's true. Nothing going to happen. All right, give that to the girl. All right. Now then, um, but uh, basically a continuous monitor is, is only going to be watching something that's supposed to be operating all the time. The oxygen sensor is going to drop offline during open loop or whenever the engine is cold. Uh, the catalyst can only be monitored after a certain amount of time at road load at a certain temperature and all that kind of stuff. And the EGR is not working at idle. You got me? The EGR is only going to be working when you're cruising down the road with a warm engine at a steady cruise. Now, I tell you what, there's two situations where th some things drop offline. Uh, at wide open throttle, you go into open loop fuel control and EGR falls out. And at idle, EGR falls out. So if you're at wide open throttle, uh, you know, the last thing you need at wide open throttle when you're passing a semi going up on a hill on the way from Enterprise is your engine controller jacking around with your fuel trim. You know, you need to just give it what it needs, you know, and all that. So you're not going to have, that's, that's, a, that's an open loop mode when you're at wide open throttle. Open loop is only in relation to the oxygen sensor, though. Don't get confused about that. Oxygen sensor is being ignored in open loop mode. It's, it's looking at everything else except the oxygen sensor as far as an input. Uh, diagnostic trouble code PO302 is a what? I'm stuck on B, but... Huh? 
D. It's got to be D because none of those other ones match that. That's actually what. What does that code mean? What's a PO three hundred two? Come on, guys. That's a misfire on cylinder yeah. number two. Yeah, that's what that is. You ain't seeing none of the rest of them. It's generic. What defines it as a generic code? PO. PO. If it was P one three hundred two, which you're not gonna see that anyway. But anytime it's got the look up there. See that. See how that little chart up there with the diagnostic trouble code set up? If that second character is a zero instead of a one, then you're basically looking at a generic code. You got it? All right. So let me see here. Global OBD2 contains some data in what format? Hexadecimal. I ain't got no Roman numerals. I ain't never seen no plain English in there. Yeah. But anyway, but hexadecimal is the right answer for that. By looking at the way diagnostic trouble codes are formatted, which DTC could indicate that the gas cap is loose or defective? A. P0221 B. P1603 C. P1301 D. P0442 There's going to be D. Let's go P0442. Uh, you know, four, the four series codes have got to do with air. You know, your EGR or your... Yeah, see that? You see how that thing's laid out? Might not be a bad idea, guys. Listen to me. Take your cell phone and snap a picture of that so you'll have it for reference. Because it's wow. giving you that that little oh, that wow. thing right up there on the wall. That is really a beautiful layout of how those codes are, are formulated. And if you can look at that and memorize those numbers, you'll know when you look at a code, you know, what's usually going to be the problem, you know. But anyway, uh, in other words, as soon as you see a code, like if it's a 700 series code, like a P07 or a P17, whatever, it's transmission related. Got me? I mean, let's just give you an example of how that kind of thing works. <coughs> and he heads up there with his cell phone. Transmission diagnostic code. Yeah. Yeah, take a picture of that little thing and use it for, per for future reference. That's the handiest thing in the world. Huh? Because I can't. Can I copy it? Yeah. I mean, you can, uh, I mean, I've, I've got that somewhere. I'll see if I can okay. put it over. You can just write it on paper, yeah. you know. You can I just, have no memory. Yeah. I got one picture. In the I was wondering how can you kept forgetting things. Okay. Yeah. Let me see here. The computer will automatically clear a diagnostic trouble code if there are no additional detected faults after how many? That's Charlie. 40 consecutive warm-up cycles. That's a kind of a generic number. You'd be surprised how many times, you know, the, the number of times it warms up is a, a you know, a thing that it, a counter that it uses for that kind of stuff. Uh, a pending code is set when a fault is detected. How? The first fault of a true tip two trip failure. You may pull your codes, and you may look at, when you, when you're looking at your codes, you may find out that you've got a uh, code that's pending. It hasn't turned on the check engine light, but there's something coming. You know what I mean? Basically. Now, once again, it's going to set freeze frame data when it finally sets that code. And the freeze frame data is going to tell you how fast they were going, what the temperature was, what the fuel trim was, and so on and so forth. It's going to give you a bunch of, uh, you know, where the throttle angle was, what the engine load was. And basically, that's so you can duplicate that window and try to get it to act up the same way. That's why that, what that's all there for. Chrysler calls that a similar conditions window. All right, let's look at this now. Technician A says that when the MIL is on, the technician should retrieve the DTC and follow the manufacturer's recommended procedure to find the root cause of the problem. Technician B says all OBD2 monitors must have the enable criteria achieved before a test is performed. Who's right about that? That's basically C. Both of those guys are right. Whenever you're pulling a diagnostic trouble code, guys, this is how you do that. Let's say that you're working on something and it's got several diagnostic trouble codes in it. When you first open up the scan tool, you plug it in, you go look at your diagnostic trouble codes, you see a big, you know, laundry list of them in there. Like, you know, 10 or 8 codes or 6 codes or 5 codes or whatever. The first thing I'm going to do, and the scan tool has got the capability to save those, but I don't trust that. I'm going to have me a piece of paper here, and I'm going to write down what those codes were. Got me? I'm putting them down, so I'm not, I'm not going to try to commit them to my memory. Because like Joe... I may not remember them, see? All right, so I'll write these things along here, then I'm going to lay them aside, and I'm going to clear those codes, and then I'm going to drive it again on a nice, you know, 10, 15-minute test drive, and I'm going to see which one of those codes came back. 
the one that comes back on that test drive is going to be the one you need to attack first. Now, if you just pull the trouble code and then you dive in there and start trying to fix it, it, that thing may be a fluke and it may have been on its way out anyway. So you're wanting the one that's going to return. See, that's going to give you the one that's the most pressing. That's the way that's supposed to be. Let me ask you this. Okay, like on my Ranger, it gave me a list of codes, about eight of them. Mm -hmm. And then it came back and gave me two of the ones that were from the top. I think it said something like living codes and being a city. Yeah, you've got, you basically on that Ranger of yours is old enough to where it's got a, uh, there's a separator code in between the on-demand and the continuous codes. And the separator code on that is a 10. In other words, if you've got, uh, if you got the old three-digit codes before these P's came out, you know, like on that Ranger, uh, you'd get a, like a, a 118, a 332, and whatever all these other codes would be. It's going to give you each one of those twice. And then it's going to give you a 1 with nothing after it, which is a 10. And everything after that 10 is going to be your memory codes on those older forms like you got. Like on the Escort, Melinda's building the engine on and all that stuff. But one way or another, you could, even in that case, the on-demand code is what's wrong right now that it knows is wrong right now. The memory codes are what's not wrong right now or that it can't check right now, but it saw something wrong with. You got me? Like a lean condition that was present and isn't now or something like that. You wipe those codes out, and the way you do it is right after that 10 flashes, you, you take it out of self-test, and that clears all the codes out on those older forms. That's how you do that. Uh, uh, anyway, um, and <laughs> those old eat three systems that they used to have on the old Lincolns when I worked at Lincoln Mercury in the early 80s, uh, they, the barometric pressure sensor had two hoses on it. One of them went to the at a vacuum it was going to the engine, and one just had an open port that went to the atmosphere for barometric pressure reading. In those old days, a big old eight hundred dollar sensor about as big, and uh, so we would take and pull a vacuum on that barometric pressure port for a certain amount of time. And then it would start, you know, switching the uh, solenoids for the air pump back and forth. And that's how it gave you your codes. And I built a little box. The first time I ever built a tool that was a box with lights in it was in 1983 or 84, whatever it was I worked over. And I would hook that up to that little diagnostic connector on the fender, and it would go back and forth and do a dance, and I could figure out those codes. When they started flashing together, I'd count them. That wasn't in the book anywhere. I just had to figure that out. I mean, you know, they did have a little, a couple of little items in the book, but they didn't give you what you needed. Everything they give you some code stuff, but it, they were they learn, later they learned better how to write shop manuals. You know. Okay, so let me see. Um, let me see. Let me see. Uh, where are we at? What did I? What if twelve? Uh, the malfunction indicator light is turned off under any of the following conditions except what? A. Power to the PCM is disconnected. B. Codes are cleared with a scan tool. C, PCM diagnostic link is grounded, or three or D vehicle has driven three consecutive trips with a warm-up cycle without detecting a fault. That's C, basically. Diagnostic link is grounded. What's up with that? Uh, let me tell you something else about these things, too. On some vehicles, on Fords particularly, but not necessarily GMs, and I'm not sure about all of your Chryslers, if you, sh you know the reference voltage wire that's coming to your sensors, the five volts? If you short that ground, you won't get no codes, you won't get no spark, you won't get no fuel injection, and the, and the engine controller will be completely asleep if it's shorted the ground. So if that wire rubs the ground somewhere, and you're set, and you you know you coast off the side road with your scan tool plugged in, it's going to say I can't talk. And if you've got a shorted, if your PCM ain't talking because maybe it ain't powered up, or the five volts is shorted the ground or whatever on one of the vehicles that's like that. And the scan tool is pretty much worthless. You may, I don't care what kind of scan tool you guys, you may as well throw it in the seat and go out there and find out what's wrong. You know, if it won't talk over that link, you know. One guy had his Ranger in there, and he was going to wire up a radio or something, and he went under that data link, and he said, I don't know what this is all about. If I see some power and ground here, he just cut the wires <laughs> and wired his radio. <laughs> so you had a diagnostic, I mean, a DCL with a little stubby wires sticking out not going anywhere well that's a fun job to straighten out but anyway <clears throat> that's like the guy when we first started getting titles in alabama that got a title in the mail to his truck and he said oh what this is and he threw it in the trash <laughs> the little farmer all right let me see here um 13 technician a says an obd uh, that obd2 generate includes generic as well as manu vehicle manufacturer specific diagnostic trouble codes and data displays technician b says OBD2 have common diagnostic trouble codes. Which technician is correct? 
Yeah, that's going to be both of those guys. You, there's a lot of the times when technician A and B are both pretty smart. You know, they both know what we're talking about. There's other times when one of them was a buffoon and he has no idea what he's talking about. Um, a U-type DTC indicates a problem with what? Anybody got any idea? A U-code. Uh, network. Network code. But uh, So what's that going to translate to on our answer choices here? Communication. Or it's going to be communication-related systems. Uh, an element of the onboard diagnostic management system which stores engine data during a diagnostic trouble code set is called what? Absolutely. Charlie freeze frame. Now, see, that's just basically a little snapshot of some parameters. On onboard diagnostic systems levels 1 and 2 are being discussed. Turn that air conditioner down at 1 degree over there so that thing will come on. Okay, onboard diagnostic system uh, level one and two are being discussed. Uh, technician A says only OBD2 systems require misfire detection. Technician B says OBD1 was capable of detecting exhaust emission control system failures. A is the only one right on that. OBD1 did some pretty cool stuff, but it had no earthly idea if your catalyst was working right or not. It did not detect misfires. There's a lot of stuff that it just absolutely didn't do. And basically we needed to do better than that. Uh, my wife said at her bank window, this old truck pulled up out there yesterday. It didn't have, obviously, the emission controls. It was an old truck with a carburetor on it. The emission controls didn't have any, I mean, we're not hooked up anymore or on it or something. It was set out there in that idle for a while while she's having to wait on them. And the exhaust from that truck came in that uh, drawer that she slides out and filled up the whole bank. It's just nasty. She said everybody, everybody from even the business, I mean, from the, uh, proof department was coming back here won't know what this smell was, you know, but that's one of the reasons we need these emission controls because things used to be like that all over the place. Um, let me see, uh, and I remember when it was like that. <laughs> uh, okay, let me see. Uh, element of the OBD2, no, never mind, I went, went past that. Uh, in an OBD2 system, when all enabling criteria for a given diagnostic test is met, diagnostic is met, is considered which of these terms? That's a trip. It'd be yeah. tripping, yeah. Technician A says, warm-up cycles are used to erase diagnostic trouble codes and freeze frame data. Technician B says, OBD2 requires the diagnostic system to monitor all emission-related components and systems. Which technician is correct? That's C. Both of them. See, both of those guys are pretty smart. Yeah. Which organization developed guidelines for OBD2, EPA, and CARB? That's an right. Environmental Protection Agency and the California Air Resources Board. Which of these is checked during an OBD2 functionality test? Functionality test. Remember what I told you the difference was? How about transmission shift solenoids? Huh? Yeah. She was. She checks those for functionality. I don't know why it feels so hot in here today. Uh, I don't know, and I'm not even drinking hot coffee either. Uh, technician A says. Module communications networks are used to reduce the number of wires in a vehicle. Technician B says that a communications network is used to share data from sensors, which can be used by many different modules. That's, uh, that's C, man. That's C. That's C. They're going to reduce the number of wires on a vehicle because if you're able to share data, you got what I'm saying? If you're able to share data, you don't need as many wires. I will tell you this, though. In spite of everything else, it's kind of like uh, when my mother, she, my mother likes books, and so my dad says, all we got to do is put a new shelf up, and she fills it up with books, and all of her shelf, bookshelves are full, and I can put another shelf up there, and she'll fill it up with books too. Well, what they've done is, it reduces the number of wires, but all they did was say, hey, now we've got more room, we can put more stuff and more wires. You know, and I was showing somebody the other day how I, F-35B Joint Strike Fighter uses like six million lines of computer code, you know, and uh, the 2010 model Ford Fusion or something uses um, like 200 million lines of computer code. <laughs> These cars are using more computer code than fighter jets. <laughs> yeah. All right, so. Well, let's just put guns on them and send them out to war. Well, we don't hardly ever do that because they, uh, the, the fighter jets, uh, they don't have as much to do as the car does, you know what I'm saying? The fighter jets are fun to watch and everything, and they make good movies, you know, but technically your car has got to do a heck of a lot more for you than that fighter jet does, you know. Uh, uh, 22, a module is also known as a what? 
wait a minute. So we got we got conflicting answers. It's a node. It's a node. It's a node. We're talking network stuff, folks. A high-speed controller area network bus communicates with a scan tool through which terminals on the data link connector? Now you go. It was a pop test on these, so you need to remember them. You got to memorize this, Scott. Four and sixteen. Yeah, six and fourteen. Six and fourteen. They're trying to confuse you by putting four and sixteen, but it's actually six and fourteen. Got that? Uh, UART uses a signal that toggles. Uh, uses a blank signal that toggles to zero volts. That's a UART network. That's uh, A. Five, five to zero volts. It toggles back and forth. And, uh, okay. Number 25. GM class 2 communication toggles between what? Eight volts. Zero to eight volts. I mean, uh, excuse me. What am I saying? I'm all screwed up. I'm all screwed up. Excuse me. That's, that's number 25, isn't it? I was looking at the wrong set of uh, choices. Somebody guess at it. Tell me what you think. That's going to be C anyway. Zero and seven. Which well, is close to eight volts. Come on. Yeah. Which terminal of data link connector does General Motors use for Class Two communication? Class Two communication is, you know, still, you know, fairly widely used in our later model vehicles too. Twenty-six. It's going to be. That's going to be. A, that's going to be two. Yeah. Uh, GM LAN, GM local area network is uh, General Motors term for which type of module communication? That's A, you know, that's the high speed CAN. Uh, okay, CAN H and CAN L operate how? Now, this is something you're going to have to memorize too, isn't it? CAN H goes to 3.5 volts when transmitting. CAN H is at 2.5 volts when not transmitting. Can L is at two and a half volts but not transmitting. Can you remember all that? Are you confused yet? All of the above. Twenty nine. Which terminal of the OBD two data link connector is the signal ground for all vehicles? Four. Four. Very good. Hear it? Thirty. Terminal sixteen of the OBD two data link connector is used for what? Twelve volt positive. Twelve volt positive. Very good. You go there, you're gonna know which one it is. 31, Technician A says a breakout box, which is acronymed BOB, you know, can be used to access bus terminals while a scan tool is used to activate the modules. Technician B says a 38 cavity diagnostic connector is found on many BMW and Mercedes vehicles under the hood. Who's right about that? Both of them are right. The, the German car people... Uh, started that. I remember back eons ago, Volkswagen used to have a big, I mean, bugs, the old bugs. Not the real old bugs, but the ones that were made later on. They actually had, yeah, they had a big old diagnostic connector in the engine compartment that you plugged a machine in at the Volkswagen dealership. The bus had that too. It was kind of silly because all you did was say yes and no. You know, this yes and no stuff. And the MS-1700 scan tool that we use on Renaults, whenever I, we got the Renault franchise, they would the thing would ask, say, it would ask first one question and then another with you saying yes or no, and that little thing going across there. And you could also look at data and all that, but you just had one line, you know, it wasn't really all that great. This is old technology. And what was so dumb about it was when you were troubleshooting something, it would ask you a bunch of questions, and if it got to the end of its thought process, if you could call it that, it would say, engine failed to start because of fuel mechanical or ignition problems. Well, I knew that before I ever opened the hood. Got me? And one time there was a guy, a training guy, on one of these videos that he put out there, and he was explaining this. And he says, uh, and he, he read that code. You know, I mean, uh, engine failed to start due to fuel mechanical or ignition problems. And he says, well, at least we know there are no financial, political, or medical problems. <laughs> I mean, this was a trainer on the tape, you know, that was dumb. But anyway, uh, we kind of got past all of that, fortunately. All right, then. And I forgot which one I'm on. The process of sending multiple signals uh, of information at the same time over signal wire and then separating the signals at the receiving end is called what? That's multiplexing. Um, do we have anything that we do that with on our regular personal computers? An external, and I'm talking about a regular computer like this one right here. 
Well, mean, sort of, but I mean, like I'm talking about something you use. No, I mean, that does this. It actually uh, sends multiple signals of information at the same time over a signal wire and separates the signals receiving the end. Which, which, which one of your inputs to your computer does that? Huh? USB port. Listen to that guy. All right. Now, let me tell you this. I go home the other night. I'm digressing a little bit here, but I do that sometimes because I'm the boss and I can. But what happens is I go home and I boot up my computer. And I don't, I don't buy computers. I build my computers, you know. My wife's computer I buy. My computers I build. She wants me to buy her one, but I build mine. So I punch this thing, and it comes up to the splash screen, which tells you which motherboard you got and all that hard way. And it stops. Oh, yeah, I remember reading Remember me reading about that? Yeah, yeah I read it. <laughs> I didn't ever tell you the credit on me. Said, this is a nonlinearity. You know, you go home, I'm going to boot my computer up, check my email. Uh uh, no, you're not. And it turned out the dadgum serial bus was shorted coming from my scanner. When I unplugged the scanner, it boot up. I put my backup computer in there, plugged everything into it, and it did the same thing. And I said, no, wait a minute. I knew that sucker was working before. There's got to be. You know, so anyway, when I started unplugging the USB stuff, because USB, sometimes you'll have a jump drive plugged in, and it'll try to boot up on that jump drive. And it just goes south, and you'll think, my computer died. Ah, you know how you panic and everything, you know, and you got all this stuff. You're trying to get your bills paid or something. All right, but anyway, um, that's, I, that was just, hmm, got to me. Burned my whole evening. Let me see here. What we got here? 33. Low-speed networks operate at less than how many bits per second? What is a, uh, what is a, well, actually it's less than 10,000 bits per second. Um, you were thinking really low speed, weren't you? All right. Uh, what's a bit? I know that is. My computer uh, Well, if you're using eight bit code, huh? Something smaller than a byte. Yeah. How many how many bits makes a byte? Eight. How do you spell byte? B Y T E. B Y T E. B Y T E. Anytime you're talking about communication, like you know, if you've got your uh, how fast your connection is, it's always bits per second, not bytes per second. You know. But it's really easy since they use, you know, you know, the uh, the B for both of them. Uh, remember the binary code thing I gave you? Yeah. Each one of those values is a bit. It's like letters in an alphabet, sort of, but there's only like, and it's going to be an off or an on. That's what digital is all about. Everything's ones and zeros, you know, it's either off or on. And when they broke the code in World War II, the Japanese code, they used a bunch of relays you know, somehow or another. And they made the first computer that way, and it would click, 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 click all those relays off and on, you know. Anyway, uh, and that's what basically what these are doing. They're turning off little tiny transistors off and on. All right, let me see. Uh, the UART data bus operates at a baud rate of what? Anybody know? That's B, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what he said. Okay, right. All right, that's 10,000. No, I mean, excuse me, 8192. I looked at the wrong line. Which of these commonly designated D2B is an optical bus system connecting audio, video, computer, and telephone components in a single ring structure with a speed of up to 5,600,000 bits per second? That's C. That is a digital, a domestic digital bus. All right. 36. Which terminal of the OBD2 data link connector is the chassis ground for all vehicles? Actually, it's five. Four and five are both grounds. An OBD1 Ford is able to provide engine serial data if there are terminals in which cavities of the DLC? Now, we had this question the other day. That's going to be D, one and three. The DLC is the little house stop looking thing. All right, let's hurry. We're going to get through here. Which of, which of these is a version of bike flight and high-speed serial communication system for in-vehicle networks? Flex-ray bus. A single-wire serial communications protocol that uses one master control module and many slave modules. What's that called? That's called a Motorola Interconnect. That's MI. 40. Technician A says a candy module will flash the red LED rapidly if communication is detected. Technician B says a twisted pair of wires where two wires connect or twisted to prevent electromagnetic radiation from affecting the signals. That's B. And then finally, 41. Technician A says Chrysler OBD1, a vehicle equipped with a bus system called Serial Communications Interface. That's right. 
and the Chrysler Programmable Controller Interface, PCI, is a three-wire, actually A is the only one right, PCI is a one-wire bus. And we're done. How about that? <laughs>